Hi everybody, Todd Demikerns here. Today again brought to you by our fine friends at Honer Music, maker of multiple great musical instruments, of which I have a lot and I plan to get more, trust me. Uh, today, a very good friend of mine, uh, I originally became aware of him uh, singing in George Lynch's Lynch Bob back in the day. Uh, he's an amazing vocalist. Uh, he went on to be in Cry of Love. He uh, tells a little story about shadowing Ozzy Osbourne. Look out for that. He has been with Warrant ever since Janie Lane's passing uh, for years, for a long time. But he's an amazing singer, an amazing person, my dear friend, Robert Mason. We are recording. Bright and early in the morning, we're recording. All right, all right. Robert. How are you, brother? In the harsh light of day. I'm all I know, yeah. You? It's like, yeah, it's like vampires <laughs> it's like in the morning. Bright light. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. It's so funny because when you asked me, do you want to do this at like 9 a.m.? And I was like, uh, yeah, I could do it at 9 a.m. Do I want to? Uh, but I, it's always, it's very rare in the in the rock and roll world to find. Would you rather have you awake or not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But my eyes are all like still puffy anyway. But it's like one of those things where you, in the rock and roll world, you don't. Well, that's not true actually. The, the older we get, the more morning guys I'm finding. Uh, it used to be no one was up before noon at least, maybe four in the afternoon. Or that was, I know, and I think that was a symptom of our youth and bus life, like mm. bus touring life. Absolutely, yeah. The fact that we're doing so many fly dates now, and it's it requires sometimes you know four thirty lobby calls a.m. after That's... a show which you can't fall asleep, and then you you know what I mean, and that whole countdown where you're you're laying in your bed after hearing like for hours and guitars and stuff, and then like an hour later you're showered in your own room with the door locked you've made your calls nobody you know is really awake except no. maybe one or two people and you are sitting there going wow cable's terrible at like this. <laughs> in the lobby call. oh my god <laughs> you're yeah. like what is this Daphne Coleman movie I've never even heard you know it's whatever random 80s movie that you're like what is this <laughs> <laughs> um yeah you're, it's you're blessed if you find something that you can watch to put you to sleep. Now, is that something that you think about now that you've been home for nine months or eight months or however long you've been home, um, that you think to yourself, well, like, I can't wait. For the, yeah. I can't wait for the 4.30 lo no, lobby call, you know? Is that uh, something oh, that you're- will be absolute, absolute godsend, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, come on, aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. All the things we complain well, about. Yeah, all the things we complain about will soon be like, please let that happen. Please let me get a terrible, like, two, two hours of sleep lobby call. Yeah, please let the air, airline lose all my luggage so I have to show up in what I flew in. <laughs> Walk on stage. I'm going and, on, I'm going on what I flew in. You know? yeah, yeah. Walk That's on stage. Folks. There you go. This is me. Here we go. All right. Here. Uh, so, yeah, we were just talking about, of course, your T-shirt is a limelight t-shirt there's actually a cool documentary i'll find it for you about the limelight the guy who was involved in it and there was a bunch of like dubious goings on that that eventually led to it being shut and shut down but that leads me to my oh, i saw a lot of dubious goings on at the limelight uh, yeah, I know. yeah it was an old church and there was like corners and rooms that you never even knew were there as you would go you know what is this and there'd be dubious goings on in 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 that place but yeah i mean i don't know what you're prone to want to mention on your, on your <laughs> yeah. Or, but yeah there was the Alice in Wonderland painted up room in the back and it was a it was a monastery it was like a, a church so for you kids at home that have never been to limelight all the pews were gone and that's yeah. where the audience was and there were girls in cages swinging and you were playing on the altar with the stained glass windows behind you and I may or may not have brought brought a uh an un unloaded cleared and checked a uh, double barrel 12 gauge shotgun into the limelight for a show <laughs> once as part of the show <laughs> like or, as a prop or what <laughs> a prop. 
Yeah. Well, it was New York City, Todd. Come on. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That was just Wednesday in New York City. Yeah. The rough and tumble eighties, right? That was so we could make it downtown <laughs> yeah. to to Hong Fat with Chinese food by four in the morning. Um, yeah, man, you would go on at like one, two, three in the morning. Yeah. It would still be absolutely raging. That was New York City. It's like I, I never went on. I never hit the stage. I played there a bunch of times in a few bands. But okay, so the shotgun story is. There was a, I was in a band that had a song that was kind of a shuffle, like a Van Halen kind of shuffle thing. And there was a break right before the guitar solo where everything stopped and it was just went with the theme of the song. Wow. So when we played it live, I'm like, we have to do the shotgun thing. It's like, what? No, no, it sounds like a horrible <laughs> idea. What time should I go? <laughs> yeah. This sounds like we're all going to go to jail. I'm in, you know, like, so. In a uh, in with mic stands and other stuff that I brought, I brought my friends side by side, double barrel shotgun, <laughs> and did that into the into the mic ball room. Put the breach like put the receiver right in the mic ball of fifty eight, and just right at the opportune time, had my tech chuck it to me from stage right at the limelight. Right, because there was no access from stage left. There was virtually no access. So right. you're like, boom, get this out of here, and we never got caught. Wow. That's almost anything. I, I think they got probably figured that like, dude, did somebody just no? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the theatrics, the theatrics, my friend. So that takes me back to so you're growing up, you grew up in the East Coast, right? So correct. Born where? in Bronx in New York City. My parents moved us to the Burbs. So I, I spent a lot of time in New Jersey, the whole New York metro area. Wow. So what was around all of that? So what was mom and dad's they grew up in that area they grew up east coast or or no both born in the bronx oh, wow. and raised wow great my mom in the South bronx if you ever saw uh, that movie fort apache the bronx was that uh was that paul newman i Steve think McLean? so but that's going back man that's going back yeah now i don't remember but that's St. Anne's Avenue that was my mom's neighborhood my mom grew up in a really rough neighborhood and my dad was more like middle class in that brownstone suburbia sure in yeah which is amongst my favorite uh there's a fran lebowitz documentary series on netflix uh martin scorsese is directing it and it's all about new york city and i've just been like like i just sit there and like i just love i love yeah. new york city that way it has that energy but so the interesting thing when i when i talk about new york city with the anthrax guys or you know, like coming up in that music scene is a whole other animal from Los Angeles. Like it's a whole other thing. And so oh, yeah. is that where you cut your teeth? Is that where you grew up? I mean. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I had never been west of the Mississippi before I was in my early 20s. Wow. OK, so, yeah. So you you had the whole New York City like uh, yeah. rock and roll experience. then, yeah. You know, you play at the cat club, you rehearse it. SIR or Montana or someplace, you know, like that. Yeah. And go to those old showcases for all the labels where they would sit at one end of the rehearsal space on a couch and you had to, you know, pretty much pretend you were Kiss Alive too on the other side of the room, you know, <laughs> it was like, and what, Madison Square Garden saw so many amazing concerts there. So oh, yeah, wow. very cool. Yeah, that's so crazy. I saw Ring and Run on the Bailey Circus there. At really? when I was two and three and four. Like I, those are some of my earliest memories. Wow, cool. Yeah, no, it's it's such an amazing, amazing juxtaposition between, I'm actually le reading Lenny Kravitz's book, which is interesting because he's born and raised in New York City till mom gets the Jeffersons. And then all of a sudden it's like- and you went Right. And it's just LA, this, yeah. it's like, you know, you're getting the, he said the most interesting thing was he said that New York City is vertical and Los Angeles is horizontal. Like everything's kind of spread out, you know. But in that creates exactly. the juxtaposition in the music scenes, the, the different kind of, you know, like the New York thing always seemed harder and, and tougher and the, and the LA thing seemed more laid back and fun, you know, at least, you know, just the, obviously there's there's versions of both on both, both coasts, but yeah. You know, you land, you land at LAX and you imagine, you know, the plane to start playing Beach Boys, California girls. Because yeah, exactly. Da, 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 da. It's yeah. sunshiny and oranges yeah. grow here and all this stuff. Like there's Disneyland, you know, and you're like, whoa. Yeah. I have lots of friends that did that early on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and went out there 
you know, made it or not, a few of each, yeah. obviously, as, as it goes, it's the law of averages. Well, um, and because of the, the scene that was happening in Hollywood at that time, I would imagine drew a lot of people from everywhere, from, you know, all over the world. So, right. but, it, but as far as your, your beginnings go, when is, when is the sort of like rock and roll bug bite you? Like in, in, cause you know what, we talk to our older friends and I bring this up all the time. The Beatles were on Ed Sullivan and the next day we all started a band. I'm always like, wow, that's so cool to be at ground zero. To me, it was like, I, that never happened to me because we were. Right, there was a, like, for so many people, there was like a pivotal epiphany moment. Totally. Not for us. I mean, I was, it was, that was I know. years before, yeah. Right. I think, uh, well, I was the oldest. So I had no older siblings to steal their record collection. Right. You know, so I went to friends, older brothers and sisters. That was always a gold mine, wasn't it? You go to your friend's house and you're like, oh, wow, Frampton comes alive, rumors, toys oh, in the attic. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> And I, you know, I'm, okay, so I'm 56. So I had a friend who was a year, year and a half older. He's kind okay. of my best friend growing up. He had a sister in high school. Mm. We were in grade school. Oh, wow. My friend was the, was the late arrival, you know, last accident, last birth. And he had right. older brothers and sisters. So they had like, and you're going like, oh my gosh. Insert any amazing 70s albums here. Of course. Too. Yeah. Like, yeah. I remember seeing... Because my dad and mom were product of that like 40s, 50s upbringing. Yeah. Where my dad loved the high lows and the four freshmen and uh, doo wop and sang a little bit. And I get uh, genetically, I sent my brother and my dad and I sound exactly the same. Wow. That's like interesting. On the phone. As soon as, our, as soon as my voice changed, he's answering the phone. It's like somebody would say Bob. So my dad's Robert Sr. Right. I'd say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of my dad's friends from work. So, right, yeah. but his, I remember everything from all of that stuff through the 60s ish, a lot of pop, a lot of stuff on the radio every weekend, records on, and my mom cleaning, you know, like being home on the weekends. Like school is school, but then you're home on the weekends and you go play or you go do whatever. I always remember music being around the house. And my dad would sit me down at a couple of these, this is where I'm going with these like pivotal moments. Right. Watching uh, like Elvis and watching sure. Sinatra. Like I, I used to get that Bobby Be Quiet, Mr. Sinatra singing. Like, <laughs> you know, listen, don't hear, just yeah. listen. Yeah. And from that and all the, his love of comedies, like I said, High Loves, Four Freshmen, kind of some precursor Beach Boys and Beatles. Yeah. Absolutely. And everyone else. My, my dad. Some of my earliest memories are singing with them, with my dad and mom, like, you know, three part harmony or two part harmony or whatever. Oh, really? So wow. They, they could actually harmonize. Yeah. My mom wasn't half bad. My dad was actually quite a good singer. So, you know, he, he elected to not go that route and get a degree and marry my mom and have us kids, you know? So, but I think he always had that love for music and I instilled it in us, me especially. Uh, so yeah, it's, it was before I understood the math of it, before I took any lessons, before I learned a piano was my first instrument, but I really shunned being a, all the theory and all that. So my, I loved, my ear, I thought was good enough that I heard something, I would pick it out. I loved the hunt to like I... pick up a song and play it and go, oh, I know that now, okay, whatever. You know, and then lessons were like the teacher with the chart and like you know, sight reading. And I would just blankly stare at the page with something I knew. And I was, and I wanted more. I wanted something different. May I learn something else as well? I need you to learn. You know, he wanted me to, he's a teacher. He wants yeah. me to learn to read. My idea at an eight or nine year old was no, there are thousands and thousands of songs I want to learn. You know, that absolutely. Kind of yeah, because it's always the same, same with the guitar. Like, we all want to play Smoke on the Water right away or whatever, you know? It's like, but everybody's kind of right. like Michael Rowe, The Boat Ashore or some kind of like, you know. Mel Bay book one. Yes, yeah, exactly. 100%, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I always kind of forget because you've always been known as a, as a lead singer that mm -hmm. you actually can get around on the piano, guitar, a bunch of stuff, right? That's, that's about how I describe it, get around. 
<laughs> well, well, I do it for a living. I get around on it. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of a glorified hack on everything else. I just like to write. So, and I like, I love, I guess I was a, I became a lead singer by default. Like I always was one, which was weird mm -hmm. because it was the first thing, you know, you, you carry it inside you, you, take it wherever you go. You can sing a song, you can sing with your mom and dad on long car drives uh, for the first five years of your life when you're an only child. And yeah. I have those those super, super memories bonded to that. And then piano and keyboard lessons where you go, okay, figure this out, but this is kind of boring. And then your first bands, you see the guys with guitar and they're up there and singing and you're like frustrated because wow. as a kid, I became very frustrated with that. So I was a keyboard player in a couple of bands, honest to God, the keyboard player. And they're like, oh, who can sing this part? Me, who can sing this part? Well, I can. And I can hear these parts in my head and not, not to be, not in a pompous way at all. No. But I was the frustrated kid who had those things in his head and I understood the, the relationship of all those parts. And I would say, oh, go, oh, go, you can do this part and you do this part. And then I started to realize, oh, not everybody can sing all these parts. Right, right. Yeah. Why? Even as a little, little kid going, okay, then just do this one. Do this one and I'll do this one. And it makes this. It makes yeah. this beautiful chord. Like, yeah. And, the, and they're like, oh. I, I was honestly, once again, it doesn't, oh, hi. There's a large <laughs> dog. Whatever. Who's that? That's Rody. Hi, Rody. Uh, what a I've been, off, I've been off for a year and I have a dog named Rody. I know, I get it. I understand. <laughs> the irony, the irony of it all, yeah. It's great, great. It's steeped in irony. Yeah. Uh, a little irony in their diet. Uh, yeah, of his course. Backstage, his, his crate command is backstage, though, just for the record. That's hilarious. Wow. I love how rock and roll you are day in, day out. <laughs> hardly, hardly. hardly. <laughs> but like, so getting back to that thing, yeah, I mean, I would, uh, I got forced out in front kind of by default. Who can sing this Journey song? Or who can sing this Eagle song? Or who can sing right. this blah, 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 whatever? And uh, I sort of just assumed it almost reluctantly. I mean, were you nerved out in the beginning like to stand up in front and do that? I was very shy and very quiet. Um, as, a as a person, I was shy. But for some reason, when you put a guitar on me and put me, I just sort of, you know, they came to life. And I think it was all, I think we're all kind of pretending to be Paul McCartney or whoever, you, you, whoever you're, you know, yeah. it's kind of like pretending to be Batman or something. You know I mean? You're just kind of like, yeah, you know. And I was, a, I was in a similar position because... It, it, I always find that the singer is always usually found by default, like the kind of like everybody's singing and then that guy can sing the higher stuff. And then eventually the, they just kind of acquiesce to that guy. Okay. You just, and I was kind of that guy, you know, be like, okay, now sing this one. And that's it. And I was just happy to be in a band. I just loved playing. Yeah. I, I would have played in the background, big smile on my face. I'm happy to be here. And then it just sort of gets, know. you know, then all of a sudden you got to carry all the, all the hassle of being the lead singer as which you have dealt with since, you know the beginning yeah. time time it seems like time immemorial yes. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> right from then on I, but i have friends from high school that never told me this until we were all in our 40s right and we were sitting around somewhere talking is i had a buddy tell me i knew we knew we knew the moment we were we were there downstairs in my uncle's bar in, in the basement of my uncle's bar where we used to rehearse and now i'm talking about we're 17 18 night like the four or five of us where was the bar little playing covers in rawway or linden new jersey like right outside okay. where i went to high school okay my buddy's my buddy's dad on the bar or uncle and his dad and i was you know favorite uncle so he let us set up like <laughs> hall pa down in the basement of this building that he was you know at this bar and uh it was one of those, okay, who can sing this part? Who can sing this part? And I kind of just went, uh, uh, okay. And was, well, you go, you go out front. I'm like, well, I'm, you know, standing here with the, but I'm the, this is, I can't put the, it's like, no, 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 just don't even bother with that. You'll go. And we had two guitar players. Like you go out there and sing. And my friend relates this story to me decades later where he says, yeah, something about you grab the mic stand. And, and he remembers me saying something. I was like, God, wouldn't it be cool to be like, you know, and then have that moment. Right. And the song started and he tells me that two or three of them looked around like, uh oh, like what did we just do? They created a monster. Right? <laughs> yeah. in, in almost a literal sense. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was that. 
I guess those moments all come together. And I was in college for a little while and just, I didn't, uh, English and English major. What was your plan as far as college went? What was the... Well, that was the thing. Law school, uh, being a journalist, being the next, you know, at the time, gosh, this is the 80s. So what's that be the next, you know, whoever. Lester Bangs or something? Korean yeah. Magazine? Yeah. Newscaster, you know. That oh, kind of interesting. Thing. Interesting. Talk, I'd be the next John Tesh. Be the next You'd have been great. You would have been, you would have killed at that. You know what I mean? Like just... I probably had to cut my hair, Todd. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what we'd all have to... Over to you, John. Right. Exactly. We can all do that. <laughs> yeah. And they but, all uh, did fine. Back to you, Tim. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, how does that work when you start playing shows? I mean, were you the lead, were you a lead singer pretty much right away when like, were you were you doing clubs and like sleeping on bait on people's floors and traveling around in a van? Or was it more kind of how that go? I went back at home and my parents were at the time in in, in the burbs. So living in Jersey, going to playing clubs, playing clubs in New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, you know, like Connecticut. Uh, there was a graduation into the cover and kind of half original band circuit where you yep. do that thing, you know, oh, here's our record, you know, and we play yeah. two songs nobody cares about and then a bunch of covers that everybody loves. Yeah. That's what pays the bills. And Absolutely. I found my way to that uh, a couple of times in a couple of bands and you kind of work your way through that. And then I started to, it, it, while doing that, I met a bunch of people in Manhattan that were like, oh, we have a, we have, you know, we were on our way to the record deal kind of thing. You know, it, then it right. becomes that, I think for a lot of people I did for me, it was like, why am I playing covers? Like, I love yeah. these songs. Maybe yeah. there's something else out there. And then you'd meet people who were, a guitar player and all these guys who were looking for the singer and you'd get poached sure by those yeah. guys it was like oh look we have an agent we have, or a manager we are in new york we're going to be playing these clubs in, in the city and i was still doing that peripheral thing for the most part outside manhattan sure because i'd gone away from that route to go play covers and go yeah. and make dough you know, yeah. you know late to early 20s and do that and uh I think I had a couple of close calls doing that, you know, showcase thing and, and writing songs and being recording studios in Manhattan. Uh, in, a rec in a rehearsal studio, I met Joel and Turner. Oh, wow. And, yeah. and, you know, I'm just some punk kid and he's Joel and Turner. Like, this is like right on the heels of Rainbow and all that kind of stuff. This is the yeah, whatever. Course, yeah. in early, in the ladies. So we got to be friends here at my band rehearsing in room. It's like, you know, it's one of those things where you walk to the, the, the water fountain or the bathroom, you know, in the hallway of a rehearsal place. And he was, hey, kid, was that you singing? Like, honestly, d verbatim. I'm like, wow. yeah. You know, and you have that in return. You got to go, yeah, Joe, Joe Lynn Turner. Yes, that was me. Like, you say his name in full, like, you <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a Chris Farley uh, interview. Yeah. <laughs> so great. Remember that time when you <laughs> yeah, were... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that was awesome. uh, so Joe kind of took me under his wing for for a half a minute there, and we were going into the city. We'd go eat dinner in the in the village. We'd go to or Little Italy, go to, you know, go grab dinner, and then he'd take me out to these jams in New York City, where I was wow. like the kid for a very short period of time. We did it a few times here and there over, over X amount of months, I guess. And Joe would sort of introduce me into this whole new thing, like. It would be, you know what some of those jams are like in the city. It's like all the guys who just got off session work and then whoever's not on tour. Yeah. And it would be like, you know, either Liberty from Billy Joel, Billy Joel band, or or Chuck Berry, who was at the time in Hall and Oates playing right. drums. Like Elliot Randall would walk up like, you're in Steely Dan. What the fuck are you doing here? Like, you know, and the Uptown Horns. And then you'd see like, you know, like a Saturday Night Live guys and oh uh, man some like china club or at the cat club or a few different places and joe would invite me to these jams and the guest singers would be like him michael bolton paul stanley and whoever else was in town you know like tony bruno who played at the time in in uh, sandy soraya's band remember the band soraya yeah of course yeah yeah all these new york guys and i was the dumbass kid who would go like hey know any beatles like oh. Well, 
it could have been worse. Do you know any, I don't know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. But I had the absolute like joy and pleasure of doing like, oh, darling. Wow. With players that were, I was so underwater. Like they were so good and I was so green. But it was cool to do that and be asked back. And like, if you don't suck, you get asked back. And it was almost trial by fire. You know, like you got to be good now. And yeah. I'm glad that I had a little bit of, I guess I refer to it always as touring maturity, where you've had a night with no monitors. You've had a night where you're sick as a dog and you have to play. And you season yourself and you, those things don't throw you that much anymore. Absolutely. And it was, by, I, I had done a little time in the clubs <laughs> crap clubs playing covers and that kind of thing where you could roll with some punches and did okay enough to be asked back and i did that a few times those experiences are the coolest because i could name drop forever i won't but i like those nights you just go can't really believe i'm here and they just asked me if i wanted to come up and sing a song like yeah it's like you're you're, you're in, the, in the dojo with some heavy hitters like these guys are all six six three black belts <laughs> You know? yeah, exactly exactly and i think that that's and you're absolutely right about that whole thing because i came from covers the cover scene as well and what it teaches you is being on stage every night it doesn't matter that you got a cold it doesn't matter that you hurt your knee it doesn't matter that what you you're really exhausted from the drive you're on stage you're playing in front of people first of all you're young so all of those things don't really matter anyway but yeah, absolutely but, bulletproof at that point yeah. yeah but you 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 do get that sort of like um, the road experience that you wouldn't get if you had just decided we're only going to play our own music and play CBGBs and the Cat Cat Club and wherever, and, and so you ended up getting like a more touring experience just by being in a cover band. So by the time you get into the dojo with those heavy hitters, you're kind of like, oh, this kid's got some legs on him, you know. And you know, albeit still doing covers for the most part, like it was a jam night. So you go up and you're like, okay, it was almost a comfort zone. Yeah in an extremely large ocean instead of my little pond. Totally, totally. And still on my side of the mic and standing there with just a, a you know, a mic and a mic stand or nothing, like just a microphone. Yeah. I'm more comfortable with mic stand. Are I'm, you? Sure, I'm sure everyone who's ever seen our band like knows that about me because I'm, you know. Like, well, Steven, Steven Tyler never, never, Steven Tyler never takes it out of the mic stand. Yeah, and I mean, I will to go sprint a lot, but I also do the dumb stuff with the mic stand. Uh, I think I was probably 19 or 20 and I welded, at first bolted, then got welded a, a go-kart steering wheel to a broken mic stand. Because <laughs> I was breaking the base, and the tripods were useless to me and the whole thing was ah, horrible, too heavy. And I'm like, ooh, that's round and it's cushioned, it's foam. This is brilliant, right. I could do this. My mechanical skills, I would get in my, my dad's garage, all of his tools, they'd all yell at me for not putting away later, and I would <laughs> make this work, you know? And then I started doing the dumb stuff with the mic stand where I'm like, I, okay, I'm, just, I'm, I'm basically just keeping myself busy. That's great. So yeah. what is, how does this lead to the things that come? Obviously, the more sort of like, you know, the more of a platform you get to get on and be seen, what does yeah. that lead to? Like, when does that, I assume that starts leading to the process that where we're at today. And that was the New York thing. That was yeah. being there more, immersing myself in that, uh, getting in bands that either had a couple of songwriters, so you learned from them, and they, right. there was a, eventually a band that had uh, the prospect of a development deal. Okay. And that was, you know, the, the holy development deal was not the biggest record deal. But the yeah. record company's giving you funding you to keep writing because you know because they don't hear the hit yet. Right. Yeah, yeah. But you've got prospects and good songs and a good band. The whole thing packages together. And there are, are a lot you, of bands like. Are you living in ahead. the city? Are you living in the city by this point, or are you still out in Jersey, or wh how, where uh, are you living? Still, still in the burbs. Okay. Okay. But going, so but very, very proximate, proximate to the city, just a tunnel or a bridge away. Yeah. All the time you know, the path train and in till yeah. God no, knows how long yeah. in the morning. Like I said, you'd finish gigs and you'd go, you know, go out to eat. So yeah. In places like locks around the clock or like Hong fat or Wo hops downtown Chinatown, like all those places, like, I don't really know if they're even there anymore. I haven't been in a couple of years. Probably not. I would love Probably to. not. Currently who knows, but yeah, this is so 
So how does that work with the with the band with the with the development deal? I mean, does that lead to anything? Or which band is this? What is it called? It was at the point there wasn't even a name for the band. Mm. We were uh, kind of waiting to find out what that was going to be as well. So wrote a okay. bunch of songs. They set us up with a producer who was doing the first uh, Firehouse record at the time. Okay. A guy named David Baker, uh, a Texan Never producer living in New Jersey with a house, in, uh, a house in New Jersey and a studio. And I would, we would drive out there and record and he would do double duty. God knows what he was ingesting to do that, but he was doing the Firehouse <laughs> record at the same time as doing our demos. Wow. Ah, the days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Where does he get all I'm the energy? Like, I was a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, never my thing, by the way. No, never, but I, never my thing. No, mine either. But you're always kind of yeah. like naively like, wow, these guys sure get a lot accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah Just, he gets, then he gets really annoyed at something and storms out of the room and I see him about an hour later and he's okay. Ah, yeah. What could yeah. possibly be? Yeah. The coffee yeah. was amazing. It always happened. Of course, of uh, course, yeah. So, so we do demos, and uh, we were signed by the president of AR, who at the okay. time had just kind of like resurrected the the careers of, uh, or, had, or had been behind, uh, it was Epic Sony, so it's Cheap Trick, uh, Heart, all of like, you know, where they get the outside songwriters in, and like those years that I think I've seen even Robin or Rick talk about were like, yeah, you know. Like the flame, which was written, wasn't didn't Diane Warren write that? Or yeah, else? it's like it's not a it's, yeah, it's not a Rick song, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Right, exactly. And those formulaic, you know, mm -hmm. 80s things. Uh Living Color was another band that just uh kind of right. launched. Mm -hmm. So we were in in the queue, so to speak, to do right. that. Keep writing, keep writing, demo and demo. Uh he left <laughs> the Sony umbrella. Ouch. a guy named Don, Don Grierson. So as it would happen, you become shelved because the new guy comes in and he's got his baby bands that he wants to do. Yep. So I think it was the change between, uh, was it Don Grierson and then did Mike Kaplan take over for him? I don't recall, but it was, it's like the New York guys and the, and the LA guys are like all those record company names that all of us know that are like, this guy went to this company and then this guy and then Tom Tom discovered blah, blah, blah. And then, you know. Yeah, yeah. And for those that don't know, the record industry really, the record company industry really is like that. You can get signed and, and you'll think the sun comes out, there's rainbows. And then that guy either gets offered a better gig or is let go and you are cut adrift as you had just mentioned, oh, yeah. because the new guy that comes in, he doesn't know who the hell you are. He's got a bunch of other prospects that he's talking to. So That's Todd, been, Todd Kearns and bands, right. Yeah. So Todd Kearns and Robert Mason, they just, I don't know who those guys are. Just put them on the shelf. And then we just sit there and, and we just eventually either fade away or just move on to other prospects. And an accountant somewhere at the label says, yeah, we only really put like 18, 19 grand total. I mean, total into this band demos and giving them a little money to survive and like okay and we paid the producer this is okay so we got released and it was just not going to ever come out right. released you know upon our own recognizance you know yeah, <laughs> just like, <okay. laughs> yeah that's the just record this, industry just write a bunch of other songs put another band together do it again You'll, it's easy Every, anybody can do this yeah you're young you're young you'll do it again yeah, yeah. <laughs> right you'll bounce yeah, back yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the record industry for you so um, what is the next step after that once you're kind of like, is that actually like a total bummer? Like you're cut adrift. I got to go get a job now. I mean, I got to put on a uniform and work at like Best Buy or something. I mean, how did that all go? <laughs> it was a, it was a bit of that. It's it's you know it's your there first, always is yeah. It's what your first is. You, you think that's your first big barbecue, and you like you said, you, you mentally, if not in every way, invest everything in that, and you live and breathe it, and then it's, you know, it's Kaiser's yeah. toes. <laughs> um, <you know. laughs> yeah. And you go and you go like. Okay, now what? Like you said, and I quickly, well, I had a pool of musicians in New Jersey and New York that were all kind of friendly. So I found my way into the next thing. And that was the band that did the thing at the shotgun, the limelight, you know. So I'm kind of adrift between bands. I'm, I'm, I'm not really, I don't know if I've ever told the story absolutely, uh, like really the way it happened. So you heard it here first on Todd Kearns. Yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> um, 
Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, excellent. Lots of uh, my friend Brian Tishy calls me up because I'm in a band that's showcasing for everybody. Once again, showcasing in New York, not getting anywhere, being told like Michael Alago, I think uh, was the guy who's, who came up. It was like, I hear woo in the back and I see Alago doing this and I know who he is. And hey, buddy, sorry. My dog. Roadie's back. Um, yeah, he's got a bed right here in the studio couch. So he went, sat right down the studio bed. Look Love at that. It. He's, he's a good studio. He's a very, he's kind of a roadie that way. Yeah. He's a Rhodesian Ridgeback, so he's big. He's big. He's big, yeah. And he's only nine months old. He's like 80 pounds already. So he's getting. Oh, big. wow, dude. Uh, yeah, Crazy. I'm getting a saddle fitted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll save you a lot on gas, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go get the mail. It's short trips, like getting the mail and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. There's the main guy riding his dog up the street again. <laughs> <laughs> Those crazy musicians, you know. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, most of my neighbors don't even know what I do. I'm like, just probably just not. the guy with loud cars, just the guy with a motorcycle. That's all. I, for most yeah, of exactly. Yeah. So, so I go. Uh, I get a call from Brian Tishy. He's like, this is band. I can't tell you about it. This Brian, Berkeley grad. We knew each other for a long time. He was, you know, Jersey guy. Went to Boston, came back. Uh, for those so that don't know, we Brian. Playing. Give a little bit of Brian, you know, White, uh, White Snake. Was he in White Snake? Some, uh, kind of. Oh my gosh! Yeah, he's been in. I mean, Billy Idol. Time, I think he's. Yeah. Yeah, he's been in a bunch. Been, he did an Aussie tour. Yeah, he's done a lot. Yeah. Uh, Dead Daisies. Yeah. More recently, and a bunch of other. Like Brian's just one of the. He's he's one of the guys. guys. He was in uh, Slash's Snake Pit at one point. Yeah. Correct. To ever hold drumsticks, honestly. Yeah. And he can yeah. play guitar and he can sing and he's, I hate him. He's so good. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that's all right. We talked enough about Brian. No, yeah, so that's Brian, right. I'll edit this right out. No, He'll be gone. Yeah. <laughs> we, right, yeah, yeah, we have the ability, right? We, like, like all the swearing I'm doing, we can edit yeah. that No, that's fine. Uh, uh, so Brian calls me at my parents' house because he and I have known each other since we were in. I guess I was 20 or 21 and he was 19. So, I mean, I've played, you know, Eagles and covers with him and JD and Zach in Brian's parents' basement wow. in Jersey when we were like, what, what seems like now when we were little kids, but we thought we were grownups, you know, we thought we were sure. going to be, we're going to be rock stars. Yeah. So, uh, so we had that sort of scene where I knew a bunch of people and I was playing in a band trying to make it happen again and just not getting anywhere uh, for you know one reason or another. And it's no blame or anything like that. Sometimes it just isn't the right alchemy of people and songs and everything else. And, you know, you have to have somebody who truly believes in you is willing to back it at that point. Cause that's the route you're going. This is before the interweb, you know, yeah. like before yeah. DIY, before YouTube, before any of this, you know? So Brian calls me up. He's like, man, I got to, I got a band. I can't tell you what band it is, but they're looking for a singer and I'm going to try to get you an audition. I know. And click like that cryptic. I'm like, Tishy, thanks. Thanks for all the info, brother. <laughs> you know, so that does not come to fruition uh, right away. And a few weeks go by as I go, oh, man. And then uh, a little more time goes by. And I'm still like slugging it out, doing this and not really getting anywhere. And I get, a call that uh, oh no no wait a minute well so the real way this happens is lynch mob is auditioning singers I guess they're I see them you know they're they're having fast forward to the lynch mob record comes out they're on that uh, they're on one of those shows on network tv where they perform live and whatever and I see that and uh, I get an opportunity to audition for lynch mob I okay. find out about it through someone else who was auditioning for Lynch Mob. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I know. As convoluted as that is, um, and I, I get to go out there, get to go out to Phoenix. I make a phone call. I guess I make a phone call late at night to uh, Don, not Don, no, uh, uh, Ron Lafitte in LA. Okay. So one of the only people in LA. Okay. Uh, you know, manager A&R type guy, record labeled guy and manager sure. guy. Hey, Ron, I, or, you know, I hear Lynch Mob's auditioning. If you can help me out in any way, let me know. You know, whatever. I go out on a date. My girlfriend, come back. And uh, the next morning, I had seemingly, I think it was the next morning, Howard Kaufman, manager, Don Grierson, 
uh, not Don, uh, uh, Ron Lafitte, rather. My name's spacing. I was too much coffee and not enough food. <laughs> and, and somebody else, it was probably someone else from the label. Might have even been like a president of Electra. Wow. Somebody else called, like three phone calls that were just, that's saying, yeah, when can you come out to Phoenix on an audition for Lynch Mob? I mean, like the next day, I made the right phone call to one guy. Apparently, Ron Lafitte woke up the next morning in LA. I was like, I found your boy. He's living in Jersey. Uh, this is his name. Here's his number. This is your guy. Call him. Click. Like, that's the way everybody tells that story. So I, I got a flight out and uh, auditioned for Lynch Mob and got that gig. Like, within, you know, I, I got the gig, but I had my band was playing. I flew out and this is, this feels, it felt even horrible at the time, but it was like, at that time you're so hungry and you want to do something and this opportunity is not gelling the way you want it to. And then a, like, it's, it's like that thing you do, you know, if you're familiar with that movie, the Tom Hanks movie, there's like a guy in a very nice camper wants to put our song on the radio. I'm signing it. You're you know, like, so you get that moment where you go, Oh, I'm going to audition for a band with them with a record deal in place. And they need a singer to make their record and, this is, I'm gonna go do this. Uh, but the next day after my Lynch Mob audition, I flew home because that night I had to perform with my band at Palladium at uh, Bang Tango's record release party as one of the undercards, as one of the support acts. Sure. I mean, the next night. Wow. <laughs> like I, like I, flew out, yeah, I flew out an audition for Lynch Mob on like a Tuesday or Wednesday and Thursday I had a gig at the Palladium wow. in New York. So during my Lynch Mob audition, I'm explaining it to, to them, you know, George is like, well, can you stay two weeks and we want to do this? I'm like, you know, and then Mick Chimes says, well, we got like 10 more guys that are supposed to be auditioning. We don't want to leave any stone unturned. I thought I had a pretty good audition. We even went like hours, you know, yeah. run out of songs. You know, I was like, well, what covers, you know? Okay, well then we're just going to run tapes and run a bunch of demo ideas. And I sang just scatting, you know, like the first things so singing, you know, whatever, a language Ooh. you don't understand. Yeah, just of course. Dumb stuff. Uh, melody more melody than anything else and that was over a lot of songs the song ideas that george had that the band had been putting together for the next lynch mob record cool so that was all at my audition in like july or june rather of of uh 91 right so i fly back on the next day and every day thereafter i'd get one of the guys in lynch mob to call me up okay the guy we had today i mean he was okay uh stay tuned Oh, the guy we had today, we really didn't care for. George left after one song. He got his Harley and left, and like Mick had to drive this kid back to the airport. Like that kind <laughs> of stuff they did, which is it sounds terrible, but they were, it made me feel like, oh, I have a shot at this. So right. then, I think week after that, George called me one day, at, like I said, at my parents' house. That's the number he had. I was sitting at home, and he said, uh, You want to be in a band? Wow. There you go. And that's and it was pretty simple. And that's the full shift. Like you're out of Jersey, you're West Coast, you're full you moved, moved to Creek, Arizona, and you know, like change your life. And like, like you said, label touring, the whole thing. Of course, you're heading into a, you know, into the volatile and crazy world of of George and that whole thing that we all love. I mean, yeah. but but how long how long were you officially doing Mitt Lynch Mob? from from that moment to uh, through i guess very end of 92 into 93 like we, we made we wrote and did a record uh summer 91 into the fall came out in 92 did a bunch of months on the road it's funny we had it was really weird we had uh howard kaufman was our manager mm -hmm. hk management and they were trying to figure out who to put us out with i would get a fax one day fax Yes. Paper, paper, paper <laughs> of kiss dates. Oh, wow. Months of kiss yeah. dates and go, <gasps> you know, and then find out that for some odd reason, scheduling or something, I there was some personal issue, I think, at one point in time. And uh, kiss tour is out. Yeah. We're going to do this instead. Okay. So it is just roller coaster of, you know, all that stuff. Once again, you learn to roll with the punches. That's the, yeah, again, that's, that's a big, that's a big uh, learning lesson in the music business too, is, is you win that gold medal and then you realize it comes with all kinds of ups and downs that are going to happen. And it's feast or famine. And we all know that it, regardless, you know, pandemic notwithstanding, 
Everybody's yes. dealing with that now. We're sitting home going, I mean, Todd, that's either that's a green screen, right? Or do you have <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've been hiding in a, in a Sam Ash. <laughs> I've been quarantining in a guitar center. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Yeah, hopefully they won't reopen right. soon. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly, Sam Ash. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> uh no these these are mine this is the re this is the retirement plan eventually you got to get rid of all this you know what i mean like and then it's so funny i was just looking on reverb and, and ebay yesterday in the morning just go i wonder what some of the stuff i have is worth like just because i keep track of that i i have a very very small collection of a couple of really nice vintage pieces that i just love the way they sound sure yeah yeah you know as you as you graciously mentioned earlier i can i can get around on guitar <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 I've been playing. I've been playing so much more since I've been here. Yeah. Kind of locked down and or not, you know, on airplanes and hotels and playing warrant shows or anything else. But uh, but yeah, I mean, where were we with the story? No, I, I'm sorry. I um, well, I, the, the thing I'm fascinated with because I know that the the right your head. Yeah. yeah. Damn. Well, the the lynch mob the lynch mob thing is such a. You know, I only can say from my, you know, the perspective of the fan watching that all the, the how crazy it seems because you're you, you're in and it seems to be over pretty fast. What does that look like on the other side of that when you're like now you're like in Arizona going like, well, I've completely uprooted my life. I'm here. I'm ready to do this. And then it kind of I don't know what what led to that um, coming to an end. I don't know what what caused that. I'm digging for dirt it's now. You see that? I'm just kidding. Stuff in the no, internal stuff in the band, as I see what you're doing. Internal <laughs> stuff in the band and uh, and the fact that the music landscape was changing, that's probably the best, that's the most innocuous way of saying it. Uh, all of the Pacific Northwest stuff and, and whatever you want to, I didn't, I hate the, the grunge word is so dumb because it's- Alternative, I think these, is, yeah. And, and true, knowing all these guys now is like, they everybody hates labels. Like, you know, who who doesn't hate the word hair band? If oh, I know, if you were, I know technically in one at one point in time you know exactly like thanks that yeah. yeah this makes a lot of music doesn't it <laughs> hey as long as the check clears you can call it whatever you want i don't care right exactly did we get paid we can go on okay. <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so that i think just personalities and in a way we were dragging the 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 I hate to say it, decaying corpse of Dawkin around with us a little bit because I've got half a Dawkin in my band. Yeah. And Don Dawkin is still out there doing the Don Dawkin band and there's a lot of animosity weirdness there. And then I, I join into that family, you know, like I, I signed up for that one. So uh, Anthony just wanted to, to split uh, after a tour. Now, I, let me back up just a second. So we did some clubs and some theaters. We're doing quite well with the lynch mob thing and it was selling you know amidst the like i said the the alternative and uh you know all those new bands fascinated radio and all those people but we came out with a good solid rock record still proud of it sure it was just you know we and the record company everybody involved i got to meet keith olsen do a record with keith that was my first record to do a record wow. with keith, like a real record totally yeah i mean i learned so much and uh, I had met Glenn Hughes prior to that, but when we, but for, for background vocals and to, honestly, I, I asked if there was money in the budget and Keith was, Keith and I were scheming one day. I was like, who can we get to do background vocals? Like, uh, can we do, you know, like he's, he knows every session guy in LA and I'm in LA for kind of the first few times making this record in, uh, in Keith's studio in Los Angeles. It's like, well, Glenn Hughes, one of my favorite singers like ever on earth, ever, 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 ever. 100%. Slouch on bass. I, no, you know, he's. And Glenn came in and we, we kind of brainstormed how to punch. I, we punched up some melodies that I had on the Lynch Mob record. Like, if I'm going to learn, if I'm going to take something, I'm going to steal from somebody. I'm going to do it blatantly right in his face. I'm like, Glenn, what would you do right here? I'm not kidding. We did that a couple of times. Well, he's the king. And of then that. it was like, well, can you sing backgrounds too on this? Will you come in? So for me, I was like, I got Keith Olsen over here, like, and I got Glenn Hughes over here, and I'm making a record. You know, how know. lucky am I? Then we see, as you said, the the way the business is, and uh, we jumped on the Warrant tour. 
playing, okay. you know, those like those little arenas, mm-hmm. basketball arena, basketball, hockey arena size places. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. With, uh, with Warren. And then uh, we were second and then Tora Tora was third on the bill. So we've all got records out. It was the doggy dog record. So it was a little darker, a little, you know, more guitar heavy yeah. and grittier. Uh, yeah. So we, we toured with them and I got to be friends with those guys. Lane and I were actually hanging out after the show. Like we'd go sure. find a, a cover band in a, in a bar after. And, you know, he would drink almost a bottle of tequila and I would have a little, and then we'd go play with the cover band. <laughs> a little? Yeah. And meet, right. Meet, yeah, meet, meet later for bus call, which was always, you know, in, the, in those days, it's, if you have to travel, it's two, three, four in the morning once everybody packs everything up. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I traveled on the heart bus a couple of times because the lynch mob guys left me. That's Wayne hilarious. and I were out. I mean, we would honestly get a, install ourselves in a cab running outside the arena and just bail <laughs> on our van. <laughs> well, I think it's fitting that you end up, uh, you know, filling his shoes eventually because those guys are some of the nicest guys in rock and roll. The Warrant guys totally. are always lovely guys. I mean, you know, I... I mean, I don't mean to just bypass over your whole thing because the 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 lynch mob into Cry of Love and, and everything that follows that leads you to being in the position of suddenly. How long have you been in Warren now? Since September of two thousand eight. Damn, that's a long time now. Yeah, and it's I'm been a happy. it's been a steady stream of of just solid work too, which is I mean, those guys must be. That's why they love you so much is that it's no drama, show up, play a show, you know, have a blast, go home. We're all grown ups and we're past the point of like stupid destructive excess, I think. Of course, yeah, yeah. And focus on the, I'm focused on the the ability that we get to go out and play these songs for people that love them. And I was a fan. Yeah. I mean, Lane and I uh Janie brought me up on stage at Compton Terrace in Phoenix when I was brand new in Lynch Mob to announce me as the new singer in Lynch Mob cool. at the Warrant Trickster Firehouse show, like on that Cherry Pie Tour, the end of the Cherry Pie Tour, 91. Wow. So that, I mean, he and I know each other that long. So, and we would hang out when we were making our re- the Lynch Mob record. Wayne and I would go hang out and meet at, you know, FM station or go do whatever. And, you know, when I was not recording, um, or after recording to you know at, at night and that's the probably it was instrumental in yeah. how we got that support slot yeah yeah what an immense talent i mean people people kind of forget that Janie actually wrote like by himself in many occasions a ton of like massive hit songs you know uh yeah i mean a, a large majority the, the the absolute like you'll always find people you know the rumor mill and and the, the yeah the people who, you know, piss on your piss on your Slurpee will go. He did everything. Yeah, he didn't do everything, but he did write. He was a brilliant writer. He was a great front man too. I mean, did you yeah. see him back in the day when they're oh, at yeah. their height. Oh yeah, yeah. In control of him, but still felt like an every man from Ohio. He really did. He had that ability. Totally. And he was a solid singer too. He, that was st- that stuff on record is is no joke. And he would go up there, and I remember seeing him and going like, he's doing this. He's not phoning it in or, or or dumbing it down he was doing it you know yep yep but didn't you know at the time and it was it was bittersweet for me because i now you move forward and i had tried to i was writing and doing sessions singing backgrounds on other people's records for money and yeah. singing on tour for other people that you're not supposed oh, to talk right. about <laughs> right. the statue of limbs on that one yeah you for people don't, that don't know, Robert would be standing in the background singing for big famous people, uh, just ghost singing, essentially. Is that is that what you want to call that? I don't even know if we're allowed to talk about that. <laughs> and we, 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 we most certainly can. Uh, yeah, I mean, on records, and then, like I said, that the particular, I know the one you're talking about, the particular, there, there were a couple of other little things here and there, not live, but on records, where sure. I go in and you know, kind of bolster and do background vocals because not everybody wants to multi-track all their background vocals and producers would think, well, let's get a different flavor in here. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, because of meeting Keith Olsen and a few other producers, I would get calls to do that. Sure. And it's it's great work if you can get it. You yeah. know, you get a credit on a record, which is okay to see my name on this guy on a CD somewhere. 
or you know you hear a song on the radio like ah hey I, yeah I remember that one that's me yeah yeah I would do, I would do sessions some yeah. and it's a great check it is the session in a lot yeah. of in a lot of instances that you know that was down payment on the first house absolutely now were you are you still living in Arizona at this point or are you in California how'd this work I moved back well right after Lynch Mob 93 94 I moved back oh back east back east Okay. But then lived through a couple of, because I didn't, you know, I want to go back. Okay, fine. I don't really need to be in Arizona. I put a bunch of stuff in storage, subliminally thinking I'm coming back out here, probably. And then, uh, then after a while living through just a horrible winter and a half in New York and just going, you know what, I got another opportunity to go out to Arizona and I just did. So you and never, you never of, did the Hollywood thing. You never moved to California, swim pools, movie stars and all that stuff. No, uh, I always kind of treated it like a place to go and do work and then come back. It's the same for me. Maybe, maybe I was out of sight, out of mind to a certain degree, but I had a couple of connections and I would get calls to go do, like I said, those sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that was enough for me. And I didn't immerse myself in the scene. You know, you go back and you think, wow, I, I could have gone straight out of high school. Right. You know, and right. Like, whatever, 83, 84, whatever, and gone right to LA and tried to make it in a band. And who knows, I might've, you know. Well, and as I, I've thought about that too, but the unforgivingness of the nineties, it might've been a big win, but it would have been a brief win. You know what I mean? And it, it I mean, there's an interesting thing yeah. when we talk about Warren and we talk about, like, I, I just talked to Alex from Quiet Riot and I just talked to Jordan from Rat. So it's been an interesting, fun little journey down this thing of all these bands that are working probably working more now than they probably ever have. And in a lot of ways, probably making more money as a live act than they are generating more income in, in a lot of ways than they probably ever have. And, uh, but there was a time in the nineties where it was verboten. Don't even talk about this. Don't even talk, like it never happened. You know, I remember like being in the nineties with, you know, we were like an alternative rock band. I wrote Ozzy right. across, I wrote Ozzy across my fingers as a, as a joke. And I remember like reading about it in a, in a, in an article the next day about like, you know, and everything was sort of like this sort of very, because everything swung so hard into hair music or hard rock or heavy metal that when it swung away, it was almost like you couldn't even talk about it anymore. But, and, and it's right. fine. And I find it fascinating. Yeah, exactly. And then I find it fascinating touring the world with Slash and seeing these kids like in, you know, in like Europe and, and South America and they'll have tough t-shirts on and, and bands that weren't even necessarily massive in the scene, but they just, they feel like they completely lost out on, on a fun era of rock and roll. And that's what, in a lot of ways, Warrant was such a big part of that. And Lynch Mob wasn't necessarily, uh, although it was, I wouldn't call it like party fun rock and roll. It was kind of more like, there was some depth to it and some heaviness to it that was, you know, it was, it was more musical in a sense, I suppose. I don't know. It was, it was, I was probably partially that and purposely built to not be as, uh, to be a little darker. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's hard to say what it was than what it wasn't. It was, as you stated, a little more serious, a little more introspective, darker, because I guess we felt what was going on and didn't want to be, you know, hey, let's party. Uh, yeah, well. Think about it, the, like you said, the warrant thing had great, Janie had a really good sense of, of being able to have a serious note or a touching note in a song or, a, or a, you know, a, lyrically or, or the, the, the way everything, the music came around to, to affect you emotionally, but still had that middle finger up at the world. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to destroy this hotel room later, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and a big party. I think they were one of the last of those big party party bands that had some depth, thankfully enough, to put some songs on the radio. And and you know, and and I'm I'm like I said, I am a fan, was a fan, yeah. am a fan, and I'm super super fortunate that I get to be able to do that. Now we still put records out, and I still you know I try to write, try to get my way around a song here and there. But I understand it's a nostalgia thing, and and I like the escapism of giving an yeah. audience. Yes, the world is out there. Yes, but we've locked the doors on this room, this arena, this whatever, this theater, this casino, this dog and pony show, this, you know, whatever it is. Kiss Cruise. Yeah. <laughs> Kiss Cruise. Oh my, yeah. This, this boat. <laughs> if this boat is a rockin'. Um, 
exactly. And we can go have, wow, that's, that isn't the last time I saw you. I saw you at NAM though last year, didn't I? Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. Oh, NAM, small tear, okay. Time flies, I know. No NAM, no NAM. And no NAM, I know, weird, right? So how does that work? Sorry, to, to, I don't want to jump all over you, all of you, but no, did you did you find so, any? Yeah. any oh, I appreciate that. Did, uh, did you find any resistance when you stepped into those shoes? I mean, how long how long of a break between Janie's passing and and the band rebooting? I, I don't. I'm not good at the math, and I probably should. Like a professional, I should do the research. But it it, it seemed like, and I, I'm only saying this. <laughs> I'm only saying this objectively. It seemed like you were embraced uh very warmly you know what i mean like you have always had a great deal of respect from people as a vocalist as a human and your stepping into those shoes seemed to be like hey man we get to celebrate this music we get to sing these songs with our you know with with this band that we love and somebody has to wave that flag why shouldn't it be robert mason you know <laughs> so, so that's not. that's my stand standing I, I, i'm i i'm I'll graciously accept that. I mean, that's high praise, man. It really, really is. Like, I mean, you know me well enough. Everybody else doesn't. I don't know. I don't know all of you, but <laughs> you, know, you know that I'm deadly serious when I say it. That's it's an honest to god privilege. It really is. And I and I'm don't mean to put too much weight on it to make it sound weird. Not at all. Uh, I but I I totally mean it. I think that I think that you you know somebody somebody's going to step up, sing this stuff, and. I think it goes into this whole this whole era now that we're living in where certain artists are getting older, certain lineups are starting to kind of amalgamate into new lineups or they've just been slowly changed. Like bands like Foreigner in, in many essences aren't even the original lineup a lot of the time. So what we're having is that the music lives on. The music becomes immortal. The members of the band, not so much. And in that way, well, songs aren't immortal. Agreed. Yeah, and if a song stands the test of time, or if, or you know, goes a, through a few generations and still resonates with people, why shouldn't it be heard? Um, I mean, we're four out of five. You know, uh, I was yeah. in a band, and I was. It's funny. Eddie Trunk always calls me. He's like, "Well, you know, you're you kind of get a pass." You know, Lane could no longer tour, and he passed away, and it's like a lot of bands. It's like. He gives me a little bit of praise because I know him for so long. He says, man, you know, some of those bands, if there's almost nobody in the band, and he has, everybody's got their opinions, and I of understand. Of course, of course. That. Now, that said, I will be a little bit of a hard ass and say, look, we're four out of five. I joined this band. I, I, it was, I wrestled with it for, for a bit um, because of all of those potential negatives, maybe. Yeah. But then I thought, well, come on. They're good songs. There's four to five guys that really want to do this. There's a mechanism in place. There's, there are shows to play, and in another, maybe manner of speaking, Jenny shouldn't be out on the road, and he's he's going to succumb to his demons over and over again. And let home is where home or in rehab or trying to fix himself is the best place for him to be. And I guess we all sort of assumed i would just come in as a maybe a temporary thing or who knows yeah and i know the press spun it that way it's like always oh, coming in to finish up a couple of their shows you know that they were obligated to and then it just became it was so much fun to do and thankfully i got very very little backlash from fans and i uh, kind of openly expected some like bring it on you know like okay i will do this to the best of my ability and I like what do what I do. I have the best job in the world. And yes, I'm singing this legacy of songs. I never even had the attitude that they were anything but just that. Yeah. The back catalog of a band that I've toured with in the past, I'm friends yeah. with and mm -hmm. have been friends with. And if there are people that want to buy tickets and go and see this and have fun and buy into it, I'm more than willing to be, you know, the hood ornament. Like the, sure. you know, the mouthpiece. Sure. So, I mean, did I even halfway answer that? Was that, was that a question or was? No. So I, I kind of, I got a, a couple of those things though, Todd, I got a couple of those things though, where you'd see there a little social media. Sure. You know, negativity or whatever. And it wasn't like, you know, signs at shows or anything like that. Uh, yeah, that's, that would be painful. You see people at meet and greets every once in a while. 
who were very close to to him either personally or or take a lot of you know value from those the lyrics or they grew up in Ohio I think when we tour in Ohio where he's from eventually I'll I'll do a meet and greet if not several times a couple times a year where I'll have someone and they and quite frankly they will say to me the nicest thing that they can muster because they can see that they're not happy somehow <laughs> but I'm doing this still and then it's those people of I mean I you know I, I don't look at a lot of the comment fodder because i just don't yeah. it's not that i think i'm above it it's not that it puts me in a depression i feel horrible i'm like okay you have an opinion that's cool i still get to do what i do and i freaking love it it's the best job in the world for me and i'm going to do Absolutely. it as long as i possibly i just found a opportunity that just perpetuated itself you know and lane sadly couldn't couldn't get out of this and and pass yeah. almost three years um almost exactly three years after i joined the band in August of 2011. Yeah, it's it's a tough thing because, you know, objectively, and, and like, I, I never knew Janie and had nothing but respect for the guy, but, you know, watching, you know, what that side of things does to people, you know what I mean? When, when, when objectively you want to say to Janie, you want to grab him by the shoulders and go, dude, it's, you're sitting on a gold mine here. And I'm not just saying gold mine financially. I mean, like, you have a great life. You can make a great life out of this music you made. Absolutely. You've made all this music that people love. And I know that the nineties took its toll on a lot of dudes, you know, a lot of, a lot of our friends had a tough time during that phase, but I think the patience of it all as, as, as the other guys in Warrant have proven that if you, if you just kind of wait it out, the storm passes and then you can go back to just me. It's, it's a different thing, but it's like, you get to go out, play the music, uh, do really successfully make a really great living at it and 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 you're doing you know exactly what you sort of set out to do and i know there's no real way to kind of like sit here and sort of like you know arm armchair examine what Janie was going through because none of us know none of us know what Janie was going through from his childhood into into the even during the good years like you say um yeah. you know what what sort of starts off as as a party sort of seems to turn into a bit of uh medication perhaps and uh, you know it, it self-management and it's yeah. right and, and a lot of insecurity and doubt is rampant in our in our business because it's based upon and any entertainment business people you know you deal with rejection of plenty absolutely. you deal with absolute elation ups and deepest downs 100 percent. and that's and that's without that's just the human psyche that's not even bringing substances into it no good point then you add that yeah. And you're like, oh, hey, palm, meet matches, you know, yeah. like, boom. And it's a rough one because, you know, uh, you know, you know, as well as I do, how many people tried so hard to kind of manage that situation or help out of love and out of, you know, just friendship. And it just, yeah. and, it, and it's, it's such a sad, I, I, we've seen it. Eleni is in the, uh, Jane, Janie isn't the only example of that. There's so many examples of people that you just felt like, you just felt they were irretrievable at a certain point and and what can you do and and it's i mean i'm not just talking about musicians we we love to kind of throw that on musicians and mus and, and and actors that they're these extreme people dude there's guys working construction who are out of control on the weekend you know or, or whatever and and you can't get out of that hole right exactly mm -hmm. and it's all it's all maintaining whatever it is that you're dealing with yeah it can be it can very much be uh yeah, to my guy's credit, they helped him out. They had brought a sober coach out on the road prior to my getting in the band. They really wanted to make it work, and he had been through rehab several times that year, even that he that they knew of. And he would go and do that game, and then you know the go through the exercise of cleaning out and getting on whatever makes him happy, and yeah, you know whatever it is. It's a tough okay. thing because I never, I don't know about you, but I never went through that. Like I never really, I don't have that, that thing, you know? So for me, it's like to yeah. watch it, you just want to go, bro. I, you just feel helpless. You really just feel like, and I, and I've had to deal with it, you know, within my own circle on a couple of occasions too. And some people make it back and some people just don't, you know, and it's, it's yeah. such a tragedy because if, if Janie was alive now, he'd be, you know, he'd be living a good life. He'd be celebrating a, a, a great thing. Um, and if you were still in the band, I'd be cheering him on. Like 100%. if he had pulled it all back together and really wanted to be in the band and everybody wanted to have him back, 
I would have cheered them on. I honestly would have. I'm not being no grandiose right. or self-deprecating anyway. It's like, but yeah, this is your band. Like I've told, yeah. you know, I, what are you gonna do? Uh, but yeah, sadly, uh, he did kind of just succumb to all that and it was, it was super, super dark towards the end. I don't mean to depress you know, everybody and, and us in, in doing so, but it got super, super dark. And all the while I was like, well, I would just focus on the fact that these songs, people st still want to buy tickets to come see shows. Yeah. They want to hear these songs. We're going to play them. I like them. We like them. We're going to write new stuff. Dixon right. and I got together right away. I mean, I got in the band right. and within a couple of weeks, he called me. And it wasn't even 2009 yet. I think it was like the winter of 08. And he's like, "Makes you write songs, right? It's like, you've written songs. I'm like, yeah. So I have a bunch of just like real, real, you know, skeleton stuff. And that's, we put a record together, came out of the, we took, really took our time, but did that. We did a subsequent one after. I mean, I've done two now. Yeah. With the band. So we have material we can play. There's been stuff on radio, blah, blah, blah. You do interviews, you do that metal show, you do like whatever oh. else. And, uh, Getting back to that though, fans have been super, super nice. I think yeah. it's way in the majority. I meet people who are just happy oh. that they get to go out and have fun at a rock show. And I'm genuinely trying to, you know, almost annoyingly so to make everybody have as much fun as I'm having. So, well, you know, it's it, I, you're like me, at least I, I, what I know of, of our interaction is I always see you. We always have a good time. We have smiles on our faces. We talk about watches, and then, <laughs> and I want your watch. And then we, and then we, and then we, you know, it, everything's. And we might be able to work out the trade for a few of those axes back behind you at Sam Ash. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, come on by. Uh, I'll give you the security code when you when you come to town. But um, let's just touch on Cry of Love really quickly. I know I've kept you probably about an hour already, but I just want to touch on, because Cry of Love is one of those great overlooked things that I'm hoping somebody hears me talk about Cry of Love and goes out right now and finds it, because it, it, it's such a great chapter that it, 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 you know, it briefly goes by, unfortunately, um, and never really kind of sort of reached what it should have as far as, you know, what it was. Yeah, How'd that come about for you? How'd that come about for you? I know he left and then you came in. You always seem to be the guy that comes in and saves the day. And then, you know. And, and then the then, band breaks up. I don't and know. then the band breaks up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wondered, uh, these are the jokes, kids. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I knew a couple of the people involved at Columbia with Cry of Love at, uh, for the for their first record, for Brother, the yeah. record that came out in, I guess, 93. Mm -hmm. And I knew the A&R guy and somebody else uh, involved right. at the label. And I think when they started having, again, issues, uh, Kelly, their singer, their original singer, the guy who sang on the Brother record, was very insecure. A drummer did not want to be a front man, hat down, didn't want to make eye contact, all that. And he was self-destructing on the road. Mm -hmm. So they had that thought that you have as a band where you go, oh my gosh, we have this deal, we have all this stuff going, this, like you said, the, the train is moving and one of the wheels is about to fall off. What are we gonna do? A very important wheel, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, well, yeah, that's, I didn't do this on purpose. I didn't always go, I wanna be the lead singer. Clearly I started out as a keyboard, keyboard player and like, I wanna fumble through guitar. Um, I was cool to sing background parts, but I'm in this role and I, it's not lost on me that that is the audiences in, in almost every sense. And it, their main connection is the lyrics and the guy put them out there or girl or, you know, whatever. The so, voice. Yeah. Yeah. So I am that person. And that is vital unless you have an instrumental band, like don't, you know, do that. That's cool. Yeah, absolutely. I listen to instrumental record. Mm -hmm. You know, I love yeah, that stuff too, do, yeah. but yeah. But you are connected with lyrics and, vocal, and lead vocals. I am, yeah. always have been from a little kid, you know. Uh, I didn't, you know, my, the first songs I liked, it wasn't because of the drum, the kick drum pattern. You know, it was because right. of, it was because, you know. Of course. She I loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sing that part. You don't necessarily sing the, yeah, the other bit. <laughs> 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 Although, boom, boom, boom. 
da, dun, da. okay everybody's stolen that of course i think i'm gonna be sad i think it's today so yeah. uh so they call me and i was like wow i've been want you to come in and audition and see if you get on with the guys and write well and i flew up and i was back in i was back in arizona at the time and this is whatever that is 90 where were they based out of like where did you have to go they were in raleigh north carolina oh, right okay yeah wow interesting and this is 94 so early 94 sometime in 94 and i had like i said moved back to phoenix living in an apartment and uh part-time job and playing in a cover band like both those things like you do sure. just survive because yeah. mm-hmm. i don't because i never want to shovel snow or cut the grass ever again i want to live in phoenix in the desert where it's warm you, you and, can uh, as my wife tells me you don't have to shovel sunshine always remember that probably yeah. so there you go. <laughs> yep, exactly yeah so this is a time when i'm i get this call from a label i'm like oh i'm you know out of lynch mob for a while i love this band we're you know i saw them at the cat club Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and some, somewhere else when I was back there on that brother tour, I went to go see them. So uh, I fly out to Raleigh and I work with them, stay at the bass player's house, hang out with the, with the, uh, with odd lady guitar player. And we, we run through some ideas and we write some and, and he comes up to me one day and just says, man, it's, it's, we're uncertain. We don't know. We're fresh out of, you know, a singer is out. We don't know which guy we're going to pick. I don't know that this is working out. And that was kind of crushing for me. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, but I'm kind of used to it. I've been through the ups and downs a few times. Like we said, I'm a little more seasoned now. I was like, okay. And I flew home to Phoenix and just, okay, well, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to be in, not going to be in crowd love. That's kind of, kind of depressing to me, but I'm not going to be in crowd love. Right. We're going to still audition people. Okay. I guess it was very late 94. So on the cusp of 95. So it's kind of like the Lynch mob thing where you had tried out, but they're still going to try people out or try other people out kind of thing. Right, and, and I think they were floundering. They were like, maybe we won't put a second record out. Maybe, right. who knows? I'm, yeah. We're just, we're just going to keep, I think they had Sass Jordan for half a minute. That's right. I think I've had it. Right. And, and they demoed, they demoed stuff with me, demoed stuff with her. So it was that ongoing process and they made it a very lengthy process. Uh, so I kept doing sessions. And I did one in, uh, in LA where I wrote some songs for this band. And EMI Records calls me a couple of, like a month later, says, hey, we want to know where, we're, where we should send your, uh, your check. I'm like, what do you mean I got paid for this session? <laughs> oh, no, no. oh, no, the guys wrote you in as contributor for like X amount, like 11, 12, 14% of their record. Wow. Of their advance, of their publishing advance, songwriting, because I was helping them. I, you know, did not only background vocals, I punched up a lot of songs and, and they were German bands. So they wanted to Americanize and a lot of this stuff. So I'm like, okay, here's where I put my almost English degree to work. Well, let's go American. Let's get some slang up in this, in these songs, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Because they were very German and very Oxford English. And they almost had that Scorpion syndrome where, you know, it sounded a certain way and they wanted yeah. to break out of it. It's so, like, that's not actually how English people talk. So we try and put some vernacular. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Don't walk around LA and talk to people like that. It's not yeah. going to work. You're going to get money. So, uh, so I get a check and I'm like, to buy a house. That's a down payment on a house. Great. Then with a very short period of time, uh, Sharon Osborne calls my house and leaves a message. Wait a second. Uh, Reality yeah. star Sharon Osborne? Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Manager of. Ozzy Osbourne. Yes, also. manager and wife also of Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, yeah. More importantly, that yes. Sharon Osbourne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that Sharon. Osborne. Yes, yeah. Uh, yes, Don Arden's daughter. So, yeah. Uh, she, I, I call her back, and I'm a little freaked. And she's like, uh, "Well, we're doing some theater shows to as a precursor to a lot, a, a whole year plus of world tour." And Ozzy doesn't want to use samples, doesn't want to use any of that crap. She want, he, he wants to have a real, real lead singer. And we talked to, three, made three, four, five phone calls. And so the next phone call was to you because your name came up so many times with other engineers and producers because I had been doing all this background work and that sort of thing. So, you know, I'm, I'm about like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> And she offered me a gig uh, to sing and this live. Is, 
And just not to cut you off, but this is the gig we were talking about where you're secretly hiding, singing along. So are you literally, are you literally yeah, hiding? Comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you literally hiding in, like, how does this work? We've talked about this before. Are you like in a booth somewhere in the back with a mic, like a, a 58 or, and some headphones or, or like, how does this work? Kind of, yes. They, uh, when I got out, we flew to Europe. Or I flew to Europe. They were already there. Uh, like I said, they had been doing some theater shows in the States and they had started doing some touring and the, you know, sampling, sampling and tapes and all that stuff was very rudimentary at the time and, and archaic compared to what it is now. Right. And a lot of stuff is samples fired off by a keyboard player, you know, like fire, you know, firewoman, you know, like yeah. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And our the keyboard player, John Sinclair had worked with the cult and he had, he put a couple of those Aussie background vocals because Oz sings all that stuff in the studio with himself. Yeah, you, know, you listen yeah. to those double, double and triple tracked, and those harmonies just come out. He had just come out with the um, uh, Osmosis record. Okay, so this this is ninety five. Great winter or Thanksgiving or right after right after yeah, between September October and something like that ninety five. And uh, so right around Thanksgiving, I fly I fly out there and I meet them. You know, I go like Phoenix, St. Louis, Chicago, Copenhagen, Stockholm. You know, like one of those where you're like. Mm. Ouch! All, all in one fell swoop with every Ozzy and Black Sabbath CD that that the label management had sent to me yeah. with a CD Walkman. Remember those? Yeah. Discman on the plane with headphones. On the plane with headphones. I knew all, I knew a lot of the songs, but I mean, these are the eighteen or nineteen songs we want you to learn. Here's the catalog. Discuss. You know, like have fun. Right. <laughs> so I fly out there and get to uh, get to my show but they they built the answer to your question is they built me an an aluminum tube frame and scrim yeah. and like semi soundproof isolation that would off stage right okay behind the subs so if you're okay. you know like the large gig where you have the big you know obviously you're you're familiar but it does large bunch of bass bins basically and I'm behind that and I have line of sight across the stage okay from <laughs> from right to left and I can see him and the whole band and I get about a window of about a foot and a half to three feet away from the top of my ISO booth curtain I was the man behind the curtain please ignore the man behind the curtain <laughs> make, make all the jokes you want and so uh with the with the great and powerful Oz, for loss <laughs> yeah. in, in actually it, yeah the great and powerful Oz it all comes together here yeah yeah. And I am the pleasing all the man behind the curtain. With the smoke, it was stage yeah, smoke. Yeah, 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 it yeah. Was really awesome. Wow, why did it take that long to figure this out? So, so, yeah. and, so what are you singing exactly? Are you singing like verbatim along with Ozzy the entire show? Are you singing harmonies? What's, what's, what's happening? I don't understand. No, not the truth is I, I, I went in there with the idea of being a background vocalist but I bore easily. And so the sound and production guy says, okay, what do you want to sing through? What do you want? Like, I don't know, man, whatever you want. Like, do you want, you don't want a studio mic because it'll pick up too much. Just get me like a 57 or 58 or whatever, like you said. And it's something that kind of isolates me and a wedge, just floor okay. wedge. Yeah. This is I'm before, again. this is before in-ears. In once again, in-ears were not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jerry Harvey had not made yeah, everything no. beautiful as he does now. So <laughs> Uh, I'm in there and I do my first audition day and sound check. I figure, you know, he'll be there for sound check and show up and I get a laminate made that first night. And they're like, you don't need to do the show. He's like, we'll just do this. So all this comes to fruition. I do my first day where I'm staying, you know, I haven't been sent home. I'm, I'm staying. Okay. And, uh, and I get up there and I'm looking and I'm like, wow, Randy, I know Randy Castillo. Okay. You know, Joe Holmes at the time playing guitar. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm okay. There's Terry Butler. I am <laughs> I am in a band that is half of Black Sabbath right now. I know, yeah. Holy balls, right? So like Geezer and Oz. We did about a song, we did a song and a half, and he stops and he goes, looks at me, he walks over to the edge of the stage, goes, You're in. Really? Wow. You're in. What were you singing? Like what were you just saying like background vocals all the secondary and tertiary parts okay that i could think of and i heard on those records okay uh i mean goodbye to romance has two-part harmonies so some of the old you know yeah 
older, older Aussie stuff. And as I said, I bore easily. So uh, I know that there have been guys in the past for, you know, bands that bring in a supplemental singer that'll double choruses sure. to thicken them up. Because as we do in the studio, we double choruses to make exactly. to lift them up and make them, you know. Uh, so when there aren't harmonies, I'm bored. So I'm doing unison of some stuff here and there. The sound man notices that. He's like, oh, cool. I can blend that in and maybe make, you know, a little here and there. Because yeah, a lot of the Sabbath songs, a lot of the old Sabbath songs don't have so much harmonies as, you know, the later stuff, the Aussie solo stuff became a lot more lush. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I get to do all those. Yeah. I mean, and I get to wear whatever I want because I'm off stage. I could I can go in there and Bermuda shorts and a pair of Birkenstocks. Like, nobody cares. <laughs> Which, of course, you would. <laughs> <laughs> in the summer, I think I did. Uh, well, even if you don't wear that normally, I would just suggest you do that because of the freedom of hiding in a, in a booth singing harmonies. <laughs> but if, yeah, see, the hindsight, a tuxedo one night. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you know. The Del Taco chicken. Del Taco chicken. Costume. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what well, the hell? Uh, Ozzy's like, what the hell's going on over there? William Shatner mask. The yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, no, well, well, there's a funny story. He would do, uh, he had that big water cannon. Yeah. Looked like an M16, shoot water. Like, well, there were two 55 gallon drums of whatever they would fill it with. It was the, ugh, the most disgusting water, like tap water from every city. Of course, and these yeah. drums. And the drums would just get emptied out and put in a semi at night. I mean, same <laughs> drums. Yeah, yeah. So just, oh, just a bacteria at fest going on there. Ew. And he would a pump and this pistol, the, uh, this rifle rather, and he would shoot the audience with water. Well, he turned it on me once or twice from <laughs> because he thought that was funny, soaking me in cold weather. In your so L. John to, Duck, Donald Duck costume, yeah, that's no, that's no fun. Well, here's where I made it fun. I made it interesting. I knew he was, he had done it once or twice. He just left <laughs> and walks away. And afterwards I'd see him back. So he's like, I really got you. And we're both soaking wet. He's like <laughs> arm around me, you know, after the show, I did show up in, in swim fins with a snorkel and a mask at one show and it made him laugh so hard. He dropped the gun. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. But yeah. So I was back there doing that. Eventually though, there was a point, there was a show in, in, uh, in Czech Republic where it, in Prague, where we had all, it was winter, I mean, winter 95, it was like December, oh. and, you know, where you're doing that. And it was my first time in Prague, and we have two nights at this big sport hall, you know, it was a monster place. I just walked around Prague, my, the first time I ever got to walk around Prague, and granted it was winter, I walked a pair of shoes to the ground, like I totally. wore them out yeah. all day for like two days, going to restaurants, going to antique shops, going like buying up all sorts of stuff, you yeah. know, check crystal and little little like uh, Christmas ornament eggs that were hand painted that everybody wanted. You know, like I brought back stuff for everybody from that trip. Um, and he came in the second night and his voice was almost cashed. Really oh, no. feeling horrible. Right. Because he was notoriously insomniac and, you know, hypochondriacal too. So, you know, if something new disease comes out, he comes up, I've got it. You know, like <laughs> right. we're good anyway. And, and, and I had such a great relationship with him. He came in, Tony Dennis, his security guy came in. He's like, Ozzy wants to see you right now. Go, why? Uh -oh. Right before the show, Todd. Like, right Principal's before, office. I'm warming. Yeah. I'm, right, I'm warm. Like, am I, am I getting clipped? Like, what, <laughs> like, what the hell? And I'd only been in a band, I guess a month at that time. Because we were playing our last shows and gonna go home for Christmas and start up again in the States after, in early 96. So I walk in and I go, Oz, what's up? He's like, oh. and he starts talking to me. His voice is all but cash, and he's coughing. I'm like, Can't, did you get medicine? What are you going to do? He's like, just sing, just sing, sing a lot, like sing. Okay. And I had been doing doubling some of those choruses and stuff. So we got together with the sound guy, and I sang almost the entire show. Wow. I split off to do harmonies, but yeah. I could feel his voice getting weaker. And I, to this day, don't know what they, you know, whether they used a blend of us or whatever. I mean, yeah. a lot of to use a lot of trickery to make shit happen and this was just two guys singing with each other you know but it i think when I mean, he came back to me afterwards he was like once again big bear hug he's like oh my god oh my god oh my god you saved me can you do that like every night from now on i'm not kidding really wow and i'm like 
Sure. And it's not like he needed it. Like when mom, when I was in good health, dude, he's, he's still to this day, such a great singer. Absolutely. Really is. Underrated. And strong. Like his Very voice strong. was so strong. But I think just the, the psychological feeling of, okay, kid back there kind of has my back. Totally. I guess. You yeah. know, and I, I was a background singer. I was yeah. not even on the program until we played Japan. Like the tour, the tour programs in Japan, the big monster ones that are full of pictures. My name finally appeared as like a, a band member. You know? Oh, really? Wow, that's cool. <laughs> that was probably like by mid ninety six. To put it in perspective, in the twenty first century, uh, and you can have a long conversation the next time you talk to Eddie Trunk about this, <laughs> um, is the recorded vocal thing, which has in the conversation talking about having Robert Mason come out and try and you know support Ozzy Osbourne. In a, in a in a booth now it's yeah. often often bands are going on stage playing to the track the very track that they recorded in the studio so that you can call up vocals if you decide to need that vocal here and there and it's becoming well, like a hundred tracks if you needed them oh yeah yeah it's become industry standard to go watch bands and go He's not singing this section, and 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 this is an interesting conversation. And I, I again, we've been we've been talking a long time. So, <laughs> but uh, we can talk as long as you want, Todd. Honestly, yeah, I don't have a show to get to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to get to. Uh, but it's <laughs> it's one of those interesting things that in this day and age, where um, you know, it's I don't think people are as as concerned. You know, are becoming less and less concerned with who that guy is up there singing these songs that I love. You know what I mean? Uh, you, I love Warren. I don't really, you know, that's great. It, that's unfortunate that it can't be the original lineup, but these guys are playing my favorite songs. And in your, to your guys' credit, you are singing the songs. You are playing live. And I really, I'm yeah, really a... We have five of us and we're not using any tracks and no. Steve and my drummer can sing really well. So he's, he's amazing. Five yeah. Words. yeah, you guys have always, those guys have always had a lot of harmonies and Steven always has nailed that stuff yeah yep. but anyway i i could talk about this all day and i should probably cut you loose but if you uh if you find yourself uh anywhere near the sam ash that i'm hiding in please <laughs> ring the security bell <laughs> i'll come let you in <laughs> yeah get, get somebody from uh somebody in pro to let me in <laughs> yeah, exactly well the beauty of it is that it's, it's unlimited unlimited jam time there's amps in here there's uh, keyboards there's there's even a brass area i don't know if there's a brass area i might have just made that up but uh i really honestly i can't wait to cross paths and what you just brought up earlier was that nam uh every every january was our way of everybody would would see everybody in in anaheim now that's not happening so we get to go past another landmark of 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 the covid thing to be Is, i don't know what a blessing or a curse i think it's a blessing in a I, lot of ways. In a lot of ways, it is. There's no name. Yeah, it, it, I'm you okay. Always with come that. back with some sort of yeah, low on sleep with some sort of flu bug or something like that. So yeah, what, what do they call it? Namthrax. Everybody comes home with yeah. some kind of some kind of cold. Yeah, amnesia, yeah. yeah. namthrax. Yeah. Exactly. But keep in touch. Uh, I'm glad we got to do this. I always love. I can sit like listen to your stories. There has to be a part two at this point now because there's so many other questions I have. But but we'll deal with that later because uh, that was a thought I had. Uh, when we do part two, though, I'm gonna move to my music store in the other part of the house that <laughs> shares a wall with it. Like, but so this is this is the office. This is kind of like this is a mishmash of everything. But there's guitars and mics and crap and amplifiers and junk around. But the other room is cool because that's the formal dining room. And when you get a house, you're like. Formal dining room? Well, that's where the piano's going. Like, you know, because it sounds great. You know, so totally. there's pianos and guitars in there. And it looks more like your store there in the other, on the other part of it. This is somewhere between a music store and a, what I always call it, a used bookstore, where it just looks like, uh, like it's basically right. a garage sale that, except nothing's on sale in here. It's just stuff, you know, like it, it's kind of like, luckily I have a wife who puts up with this kind of stuff all over the house. And, uh, but I, I have to have a little, well, a studio basically to work in. But anyway, I love you. Real quick, okay. is that a yellow submarine? What is the yellow submarine? It's a, it's a pillow, actually. And I've, I've stuck it oh, through my, my, my upright base. Here. <laughs> I didn't see that. Your shoulder was in the way. I know. It's an actual pillow, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, there you so, go. Somebody gave it to me. I stuck it through here, and it's remained there ever since. That goes to show you how much I've, I've, I've 
I've dropped the ball on my upright bass skills, but I'll get back to it. I'll get back to it. Get off my back, man. <laughs> it looks great there. I, I think it works. I think it's, it's, it's sort of, sort of, uh, doesn't kill the tone. Anyway, that's the It's a mute for the, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, <laughs> I, I do appreciate this as well. And my pleasure. To to and it's always good to talk to another human being outside of the ones that are already in your bubble. So, you know, we, getting to connect is, is always important. So, uh, but hey, all the best. I, I don't know when life will snap back, but when it does, I'm sure our paths will cross. As they do. As they do, baby. Be well and be safe. You course. too. Big love, oh. daddy. -o. Big love. Yes. Talk soon. Peace. See you soon. <laughs>